Hello all, uh, it's Bob here flying again without Ramon on the Bob and Ramon show um, for another uh, interview special uh, on a cold rainy uh, lockdown night but after some good news from the government that we might actually be getting back to normal sometime in the middle of 2021 which I'm sure we're going to talk about in a minute. I'm really delighted tonight to be talking with Connor Selby who uh, I'll explain how we met in a minute but uh, he is one of the UK's foremost uh, blues and rock centric uh, young guitar players bloody red hot frankly uh, irritatingly so hi Connor how are you I'm really good thanks thanks for having me Bob oh you're welcome it's great to see you so look before we get talking about this and that just tell me what, what are you up to you know while, while you can't you can't really operate I, I know you've been recording yes that's right um so I've recorded a new album basically at the, uh, the tail end of last year and that's due for release probably in the autumn of this year. Um, I'm going to be releasing a series of singles from the album over the coming months. But as you might have seen, I've already put out one single and um, that came out on Friday. And that's not going to be a song from the album, but it's it was recorded with the same band that I used on my upcoming is album. That, uh, is that That's All Right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, that's it's, it's a fantastic video and the sound you've got is wonderful. I was just sitting here thinking About all the things I should have done All the really, time Really tidy and clean and it actually I'm, I'm going to jump ahead now because it when I was listening to that it made me think of a question for you about the, the way you're playing guitar there is very mature Oh, thank you very much. Uh, you're not jumping the gun on anything. You're not rushing for anything. You know, I, I say this as someone who lives in a perpetual state of rushing for bloody notes all the time. And it's just so kind of, you, you're really leaning back and you're just so calm about delivering this thing. D does that come natural or, or, or do you work on that? Um, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, over the last few years, I guess I have made a conscious effort to try and, you know, cut out all the fluff, so to speak, and to kind of make my playing as tidy and mature as possible. But, um, you know, I'm just trying to play like the people I like, people like BB King, Clapton, you know. Yeah. And all these guys tended to play less rather than more. So that's just something I'm trying to copy and emulate in my own playing. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I mean, it's, 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 it's working because it really is, you know, that, that, that if that's a taster of the album, it's a really, it's a really mature statement. You know, okay. it's fantastic. So look, let, let's just chat about this and that. I mean, first of all, just an amusing bit about how you and I met. Because we were at um, we were at 6060 Sounds, weren't we, in Denmark Street to see Jordan Susanto and yeah, his band right. play. And you, you sort of look, looked at this old bloke. I was clearly the, the oldest bloke in the room by, oh, 15 years minimum. And you sort of looked at me and went, are you Bob? Yeah. And I went, yeah. Uh -huh. And so you introduce yourself, and I'd heard of you, of course, I'd heard your stuff. Um, and it was the first time I've ever uh, met anybody in, in a public situation who'd actually seen one of my rubbish videos. So, well, to, to be honest with you, Bob, I'm more, I'm more surprised that you knew who I was, really. Oh, no, no. I mean, you know, I knew exactly who you were. And I, I hadn't heard as much of your stuff as I had subsequently. But then after that, we got together, you played a few of my guitars, you played my burst quite a lot. Um, which is clearly, you know, from, from listening to your, your music and from the guitar you've got, you know, next to you tonight. I mean, you know, you're definitely, um, you're not exclusively a humbucker man, but you're definitely more of a burst guy than anything else, I think. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, and you've got a pretty nice one yourself. What, what's your burst? I'll just grab it now. Um, it's a, an R9, basically. Okay. Um, Lovely lemon burst. Yeah, I've got throwback PAF clones in it. Um, right, okay. Which I only put in fairly recently. Before I was using uh, Wiz clones. But I found these, because 
after I played a few bursts, including yours, yeah, I just got completely captivated with the tone that they had, and just not the tone as what, um, but also just the you know the touch sensitivity, and the pickups in this guitar just didn't have that. Um, so I kind of got obsessed, you know, with different PAF clones, and I went down the rabbit hole and yeah, ran out a few different you know brands and stuff. Um, but for me. Yeah, those throwbacks are really good and they're quite close i think to the real thing the i mean the thing that a lot of a lot of people you know the, the worst time was probably the 70s when demarcio were making pickups that had so much output you could run a fridge off them but but it's still a lot of people i mean there's a lot of security to be had for a budding guitarist in high gain high output pickups and all the rest of it they're very flattering up to a certain point but when you're looking for the things that you and i are looking for out of an instrument you realize Actually, it's the weak and vibey guitars that have all that touch and control. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, the kind of lower output the pickups, the more it captures the kind of nuance of your playing and yeah. the instrument. But I yeah. think that's why, you know, you see all these different players who play strats and they all sound completely different to one another. Yeah. Just because of how tactile the pickups are, really. And I yeah. think especially modern Gibsons, they just, they kind of lack that. That quality and they're something. either too hot or if they're not too hot they're too thick yeah definitely. of course there's the issue about you know most most modern gibsons do sound very muddy if if you've if you've played an old one you realize how light and bright they are yeah, absolutely yeah 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 but uh, so you've got throwback pickups in there did you have to you know research lots and lots before you found them or did you get lucky quite early um I mean, I did a fair bit of research. I just kind of looked for stuff on EUA and, and Reverb and all that kind of, all those places. And if something came up, I just tried to get it really. Right. Because I mean, you know, I mean, people can spend inordinate amounts of money on pickup after pickup, you know? Yeah. I mean, uh, for now, I'm happy with those. So I don't think I'm going to be looking for anything else for a while. And are they the pickups in the guitar when you made that recording? Yes. Right. Well, I mean, it sounds it sounds terrific. It really does. I was just plugged into a, a lazy J for that. No effects or anything. Okay, because when you came around here, I mean, you naturally inclined towards plugging into my lazy J. Have you got one of your own now, or was that? I haven't got one, no. But I would like to get one one day, or, or some kind of Fender Tweed style amp. Yeah. As you probably know, I've been using Marshalls for quite a long time, but I've never really been totally satisfied with the way I've sounded with them. Um, especially in the context of a band, I, I feel like they never really cut through very well. Ah. And obviously just, you know, the nature of the way gigs are now, you can't turn them up loud enough for them to sound good. Yeah. So like, um, I was using a, a JTM 45, 30 watt head or whatever, how, you know, however many watts they are. Yeah. And even that I couldn't turn up all the way. So I, I've been trying loads of different attenuators and stuff, but they always just, make the amp sound really farty and, and compressed, which I'm not really a big fan of. It, it, it's interesting because, you know, I mean, you, you're, you're, you know, your musical references, obviously, you know, early Clapton is, is a big influence on your, on your sound and your playing and your touch and everything. Yeah. Of course, he was knocking it out through a Marshall back in the day. Yeah. Um, with a 19, you know, the Beano album was a 1960 burst. Um, but it, it, it's interesting because lots and lots of players, I mean, mo most Marshall players tend to use them for slightly, slightly more gainy sounds where they really are quite lovely. But when, when I saw you, it probably must have been one of the last gigs you were allowed to do before it all shut down. But the, the gig you did at the Troubadour in Earl's Court. Yeah, um, I think I was using a blues breaker for that. And yeah, yeah, you had a small blues breaker combo, didn't you? But it, it was quite small. Was that 18 watts? No, um, I think it's 35 watts or something like oh, that. Oh, right. Okay. I don't know exactly, to be honest, but it's just a standard, you know, blues breaker reissue that Gibson do. Right. Um, yeah, I think that was turned up all the way and I wasn't using attenuator for that, but um, I don't know, for some reason, I w I'm just not, I haven't been satisfied with the way they've sounded. And Joe, Joe Anderton, who plays my band with me, he's my other guitar player. Yeah. He uses like Fender style amps and he plays a Telecaster and, and, yep. and a Gretsch, you know, that kind of thing. And it was really funny. We've done, because he's got like a, a, a Blues Junior that he often uses. And we put the Blues Junior in the, my 100 watt Marshall in the same room. And I turned the Marshall the way up. And yet you, 
the Blues Junior was still louder and it still, you know, cut through the mix much better right. than, than okay. Marshall. Okay. So, um, yeah, and, you know, over, over the last year, especially, I've just been going further and further back in terms of my listening. You know, I've just been really infatuated with, like, B.B. King. I mean, always have, but particularly the last year, I've been putting a lot of emphasis on listening to him. And, you know, you just listen to Live at the Regal and that tone is just the greatest guitar tone ever for me. It's magic, isn't it? Just that, you know, Gibson into a Fender amp, a cranked Fender amp. So that's kind of what I've been leading towards right. lately. Obviously, we haven't actually done any gigs, so I haven't been able to, you know, use that setup as, as much as I'd like to have done, but... It might be expensive, but one thing you should probably have a shifty at if you can is is you should see if you've got can befriend a couple of people with old tweed deluxes uh, from the late fifties, yeah. which is basically you know a, lo a lot of guitar players I know kind of talk about that being the holy grail and they be become a bit collectible and the lazy J is almost the sort of modern kind of a more reliable reincarnation of that kind of vibe, yeah. um, but some of them if you if you get lucky particularly some of the ones they've got really quite you know pressed metal framed speakers. They're not heavy speakers or anything. The whole, everything is just almost on the edge of blur. <laughs> but they, some of them can sound really, really sweet. I'd definitely like to get, you know, be able to try one at some point. I, I remember when I first met you, you were just about, you were scheduled to go out on some fairly major gigs. Yeah, And that's right. obviously that, you know, circumstances put the kibosh on that. But presumably, are, are you, you're still sort of penciled in, so when that show comes back, you're still part of that show all being well? Well, I'm not really sure. Um, unfortunately, like literally in the last week, the Who have announced that they're cancelling that tour and refunding all the tickets. Oh. Um, I don't know if they have intentions to rebook at some point, but hopefully if they do, there's a chance that I might be on that, but I don't really know at this stage. So I can't, I can't say too much about that, unfortunately. Right. You, you've been out with them before, haven't you? Yes, I did one gig. Um, opening for them at Wembley Stadium. That was the Wembley one, wasn't it? Yeah. Which right. must have been an unbelievable experience. Yeah, it, it really was incredible. Uh I mean, how many punters in the audience? Um, I mean, we, we were on quite early in the day, so it wasn't, you know, an insane amount. It's probably somewhere between five, 7,000, which is obviously, you know, the biggest audience I've played to, in, you know, <laughs> by, by a country mile. But, but yeah, it was just an incredible day just to stand on that stage and to, you know, be in the presence. Because it wasn't just the who, it was um, Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam. Imelda May, the Kaiser Chiefs, you know, all these really huge heavyweights. Yep. Just to be on the same bill as them and to be, Ooh. you know, just being backstage at Wembley and, you know, all that stuff. We got to watch the Who from the side of the stage. It's incredible, you know. Yeah. And I went out as part of the uh, the Clapton retinue out to uh, Crossroads in Dallas. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so I was there for, you know, th three or four days, you know, in the rehearsal studio, doing the sound checks, and then, you know, there for the two and a half days of gigs. Yeah, that's because incredible. This procession of insane names just walking past all the time. You know, it was just can't even imagine. It was impossible, and you know, just just hanging out with people because, like, everybody's around backstage. You know, for for a couple of days, so there's a lot of downtime, and everybody likes to have a chat. So you know, they they kind of saw me looking after instruments and stuff, and a few guys were talking to me. So I got to talk to people like Vince Gill, you know, who's just a god. Amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, Gary Clark and, oh, it was, it was, you know, it was just, oh, hi, kind of thing in the corridor. It was, it was probably much the same when you were backstage at Wembley. 
yeah, it was. I mean, I didn't actually get to meet uh, Peter or Roger, unfortunately, but but we, um, you know, I spoke to Melda May and saw Eddie Vedder and everything. She's fantastic, isn't she? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Speaking about Crossroads, I actually went in 2010. My dad and I went in Chicago. Oh, did you? Yeah. And that was one of the most formative experiences probably of my life. I got to see all those guys, you know, like Vince and, and where was it in 2010? It, Chicago. It was Chicago, right. Yeah. That was and the only time I ever actually got to see B.B. King. I never actually saw him apart from that, unfortunately, which is right. one of my biggest regrets, really, but what can you do? Um, but yeah, that was an incredible experience for me as a young kid. I think I was like 13 or something at the time. You know, you, you, you started earlier, didn't you? Yeah, I've been playing since I was about eight, seven or eight. I started yeah. doing classical guitar, which I wasn't really massively into. I did it at school, you know, um, and I didn't really gravitate towards it. But then around the same time, I started to really get into listening to music. That's when I, my playing started to improve a lot. And I started taking electric lessons. And obviously, you know, I discovered the, um, the pentatonic scale and started playing along to, you know, Derek and the Domino's stuff and the Beano album. And, yeah. and once I was m making... Um, tiny you know improvements but it's got hooked really your, your dad is quite into music as well isn't he yeah that's right but yeah. you, you had an environment around you from a very young age where you had access to all this kind of the stuff that you know i i grew up with and listened to yeah because you have got you've got again not only is your playing got a maturity but also in terms of musical taste you've got quite an old head on young shoulders yeah, I guess you might say that. Yeah, yeah. You like you like your old BB Kings. You like your old Claptons. Your Peter Greens. I know. Also, you you're mad about Nick Drake. Yeah, yeah. I love Nick Drake. Um, I went through a phase for like two years when I was like 16, 17, where I was just obsessed with him. And as you can see behind me, I've got Ray Charles on the wall. Ray Charles is probably my biggest musical hero of all time. I think. Right. Anyone who knows me knows that I, once I start talking about Ray Charles, I don't shut up. <laughs> But it does take us on to an interesting thing, which is, you know, because I mean, both you and I solo in a kind of, in a bluesish space. And something, you know, people often said, you know, how, how, how do you do that? How do you do that? But Ray Charles is a great example. If you solo over some of those chord sequences, you can play about three or four notes. And as long as your phrasing is pretty good, the, back, the backing does all the lifting for you, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's for me what it's about, really, just phrasing people focus on so much stuff which i never really have like you know all these different techniques and stuff playing fast you know the way you pick and everything but, but for me the most important thing i've always tried to focus on is phrasing and phrasing like a singer i think mm -hmm. that's, especially with blues playing that's the most important thing yeah and when you listen to bb king or freddie or, you know freddie king albert king otis rush yeah they're just playing like singers. They're playing like Sam Cooke or, or Ray or Aretha, just translating that gospel singing onto the guitar. Let's talk about your singing for a minute and your voice, because it did, did, when, when did that come along? Because the other thing is that, you know, you, you sing really well too. So, oh, thank and, you. And, and I didn't start trying to sing, and it still sounds like a, a drain, but I didn't start trying to sing until very recently. And I hadn't realised how much it does for your guitar playing, because as soon as you start thinking like singing and your voice obviously can't do, you know, pentatonic scales at 64 beats, a, you know, a microsecond or whatever. Um, suddenly you, you, you start thinking much more melodically and all the rest of it. But how, how, how did your singing come about? Um, basically around the same time I got into Ray Charles, which is about five or six years ago now. Um, I think I just watched the film Ray and after I watched that, I was just hooked. And, you know, to this day, I'm just completely in love with his music. I mean, before that, I, when I was um, a bit younger, I was just kind of a, you know, a guitar head, really. I was really into Bonamassa and all that stuff. Yeah. And then, yeah, I just started listening to, you know, loads of soul music and jazz and all that stuff. And uh, I tried to put a lot of effort into improving my singing. And tell me, did, did you, when you, when you started, you went, went about it, did you find singing came fairly easily to you or did you have to work quite hard at it? Yes and no, I guess. <laughs> if I listen back to 
stuff you know when i was like 17 18 trying to sing it just sounds dreadful <laughs> so in that sense it didn't come easy to me because i couldn't sing when i started but right. um, <laughs> i did take some lessons and stuff but I, I wouldn't say i've you know spent a lot of time actually practicing it's the same with my guitar really i just play i just sing i sing along to stuff and i you know one of my kind of hobbies is just recording myself singing jazz standards just to backing tracks and stuff um okay. which i just i don't do anything with them because they're mostly not very good but it's just you know i just love to sing i love to play but i've never i've never you know with the guitar i've never sat down really and practiced which is quite a bad thing to say probably but um i've always just played watching you 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 found a way whether it comes naturally by accident or whether you worked on it you found a way that your voice and your guitar project in a very similar way so they sound they 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 sound as if they're very much coming from the same place oh um, thank you that's that i mean really it's pro well. probably easier when they're coming from one person but nevertheless some people can sound completely different you know vocally to guitari yeah i mean i have kind of a dark thick sounding voice i think it's not very bright that comes down to the, my personality and just the way I am as a person. But going back to, you know, why I play Gibson guitars and humbucking guitars, it's because I prefer that darker sound. Yeah. Because it just sounds more like me, you know? Yeah. And, and also, I mean, you probably find, certainly I've found that uh, as, again, you know, apart from the, the obvious problems guitar players have with playing at volume, you know, in small rooms, confrontation with bands, confrontation with sound engineers, all that stuff that we're used to. But almost every amp that I've ever played, and the better the better ones even more, they, they all get slightly sweeter and slightly darker as you crank them. Yes. Very often, if you're not using them at a loud enough volume, they, they're a bit shrieky and a bit tinny, and you just don't feel good about your sound, you know? is that? Do you find that? Yeah, I, I don't like amps that sound squishy and really compressed. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not really a fan of high gain stuff. I like really dry, open, and bright sounds. When you're performing, you're not re you're not really an extrovert, but you're very, very calm and very confident. Whereas one to one, you're a much quieter guy. You know, some guys you meet and they're all like, "Hey, you know, I'm a bit of this, bit of that, and all the other," and you just think, "Well, okay, you've basically you're living your life on stage." But you're really quite a regular, you know, quiet, unassuming guy. But when you get come up on get up on stage, it's not like all of a sudden you're Mr. Showbiz, but you're very again, you're very grounded. I guess it just comes from doing it a lot, really. I mean, when I first started gigging, I you know, I was really shy and really nervous, but I've just got to a point now I've done so much of it that yep. I, can, I can just go out and do my thing. And if people enjoy it, then they enjoy it. If they don't, then they don't, and that's perfectly fine. But I'm not worried about pleasing people anymore, you know. I just kind of do my thing. But also, I mean, you know, you've, you've, you've gigged a lot, you know, you've worked hard, you've gigged a lot, and you just get stagecraft and you, you don't get wobbled by, you, every night you go out and something goes wrong, yeah. always does. I remember we did one, one gig where we had a depth drummer, very, very good drummer, and he turned up. The only trouble is he'd forgotten his bass pedal and his cymbals. Oh, man, <laughs> what did you do about that? Well, and I'm kind of thinking, God, you know, this guy's a great drummer, but, you know, this isn't really pro behavior somehow. And he was, he was a proper pro. Thank God the place we were playing had a kind of toy box, um, which had a whole load of stuff in it. Oh, and we true. managed to find all, everything we needed, wasn't it? I'm terrible at remembering lyrics. That's my, my big problem. I always okay. remember the words at least, you know, once or twice a gig, like really badly, I mean. <laughs> I just completely get lost in a song and have to make it up or something. But. How do you get around that? Because that, that, I find that really, very reassuring because I can't remember lyrics for shit. I mean, when you go to big gigs, I mean, back to Crossroads again, they had teleprompters all over the stage. No one can forget lyrics because everyone's lyrics are scrolling past them like on a proper TV show. But how do you, how do you get around it? I mean, do, do, you, do, you, do you have a few sheets on, on the floor that if, de if desperate you can look down at? or? No, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to see them anyway. I've got pretty bad eyesight. Ah. And I normally close my eyes when I'm playing anyway. So I'm, yeah, I'm very much inside my own head. Okay. But um, if I get lost, I just have to deal with it in the moment and try and think of something. Sometimes it works better than other times. Just, you know, make up the lyrics or whatever. Just try and do something. <laughs> just ad lib. I mean, I've been doing it for ages. Songs that I've been playing that I wrote for years. I yeah. just can't remember them sometimes. Because like, uh, I don't know, for me, when I'm singing, yeah. 
very much like a chain. And if one link in the chain breaks, it just goes. So if I forget one tiny bit of the song, I'll just completely lose my place and my mind will go blank. <laughs> and then I'll have to deal with it right in the, in the moment. So let's talk about your um, your band for a minute. Do you want to give your band a shout out? Your, your, the guys that you're, you're out with? So uh, I mentioned Joe Anderson earlier. Yep. He plays a rhythm guitar in my band and he plays on the new record as well. I should say that. Mm -hmm. uh, the other guys I'm about to talk about, they're not on the record. I use a different rhythm section. Ah. But um, Joe is, brought Joe along. And the guy who's been playing drums for me for the last three or four years is a guy called Rob Shearer. And on bass, I have Fergie Fulton. I've, I've always seen you with another guitar player. Um, which is quite unusual because a lot of guitar players in your in your situation would actually go, no, I tell you what, I'll, I'll do the guitar duties. So, but you 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 two guys find a way of um, interleaving well. Yeah, I mean Joe and I, you know, we've developed a really kind of special, I guess, for lack of a better word, musical relationship over the last few years. But yeah, he just complements everything I do so so perfectly, and he's just one of those guys who can play the exact right thing at the exact right time. And, you know, for me, what I'm trying to do when I go out there is I'm singing and playing and my playing is an extension of my singing. So I don't do that much rhythm stuff, mm -hmm. really. I do a bit, but yeah. I want someone else behind me to be doing the, you know, the heavy part of that. So I can just focus on, on my, my lead guitar and um, my singing really. Right. And I think both of you used to play that, that jam that I've played at sometimes. It's called the Hot Hob in Brentwood. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you used to do that. We still uh, go there quite a lot. Okay, because I mean, it's it's a bit of a schlep for me. It's about an hour and ten, you know, which is kind of okay on the way out, but get it going home back later at night. It's a bit, oh, yeah. Um, but it's 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 a really really good jam. It's, it's you know, they get some good players down there too. When I saw you at Earl's Court, you were playing an SG rather than a Les Paul. I think I was playing a three three five actually for that one. That I'm getting confused by redness. Yeah, I do have an SG though, uh, which I've got here. All right. It's got throwbacks yep. in it as well. Um, it's just a, I don't know what you call it. Uh, it's kind of 60, 63 standard reach kind of thing. BOS thing. Yep. Custom shop. Um, yeah, those are my two main guitars. The Les Paul is the main one, really, and that's right. kind of yep. the backup. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of my rig, we already talked about amps and stuff. I don't yeah. really use any pedals, which you probably know. Yeah. I mean, I, I do um, I do use a wah sometimes, which is uh. which is put by a friend of mine. Uh, who, his company is called Venus Witch Effects, and for uh. my money, it's, they're the best wahs going, basically. Right. But apart from that, I don't really use any other effects, to be honest. Right. No, I mean, you're very definitely you're you're an amp tone volume control amp overdrive kind of guy it's it's yeah really shows doesn't it yeah yeah i mean you know i've got nothing against pedals or anything if you want to use them then by all means use them but um what i do it's very simple so i just don't need them that's another reason why i don't use fender guitars really or single coil guitars because i feel like you kind of do need some kind of drive or something for them because you yeah. can't really turn amps up loud enough to get them to a point where they sound good enough i think without some kind of you know overdrive or tube screen with type pedal the, a trick i i've i've learned from just talking to a lot of people who who play that way is that almost every strat player i know in particular they always have some boost They've yeah, got yeah something exactly. that basically turns the strat into what you're talking about gives it a little warmth. some people do a really super transparent boost other people put throw a bit of grit on but they need something because the, the Strat's probably the quietest of all the famous electric guitars, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Clapton put the, the mid boost in here, didn't he? Famously. Yeah. yeah, I've played a few of those and I have to say, I don't really get on with it. It, it, it always, it, it sounds all, oh, yeah, me, me, me. It doesn't, yeah, it sounds doesn't a bit really do it. Plasticky, doesn't it? I don't know, robotic yeah. almost. I've got a Strat, which is somewhere, I don't know where it is right now. But, um, <laughs> I want to get. Not very much then. <laughs> I want to get a Tele uh, at some point as well. That's my next kind of. The next guitar that I want. Um, right. So, Connor, you've got a new album coming out later in 2021. So, tell us something about that. Um, so, like I previously said, I didn't use my usual lineup on the album. I'm playing with a uh, a new band, who uh, which is Stefan Rettenbacher's Funkestra, and Joe, who I mentioned before from my band. 
Um, yeah, the album's coming out later this year, like you said. I'm going to be putting out um, a few singles from it over the coming months. It's available for pre-order now. So if you'd like to support me and pre-order it, um, you can go to my website and do that. It'd be hugely appreciated. Um, as we've talked about, I have a new single out called That's All Right, which is, um, you know, give you a, a taste of what the album's going to be like. And uh, yeah, I think that's everything. Okay, so, okay, Connor, look, it's been fantastic to talk to you on a damp, chilly, you know, Monday evening. Um, I wish you every success with the new recordings. Uh, on your behalf and selfishly on my own behalf, I can't wait for us to be able to get out and, you know, bother people with our music again and have some fun. And also, you know, when we're allowed to, when it's, when it's legal, I mean, do come over and see me again and, uh, you know, muck around on some gear and, um, you know, we'll talk a bit of bollocks about amps and stuff like that and you can show me how to play the guitar. <laughs> I'd love to. Thank you. So, Connor Selby, thanks so much for joining me and all the very best, mate. Good luck. Thanks for having me, Bob. Cheers.